Hey, this is Brett Robbins, and welcome to Cicero's First Catalinarian Oration, one of the most famous, for good reason, works of ancient Roman literature. Let's jump right into the sort of analysis you can expect from me in these videos. I will mark up the text in a systematic way, according to a system I came up with a long time ago when I first started teaching languages, and I think it'll be helpful. What it does is it reflects certain heuristic priorities in seeking out how words mean what they do within a given sentence, how the sentence works. Think of each sentence as a kind of machine, and that has different parts that work together. Or a, or a puzzle, different pieces. I, I, I prefer this metaphor, a puzzle with different pieces, and each of the pieces has a different shape depending on its what? On its morphology. Isn't that interesting? Morphology uh, from the Greek morphe meaning shape. So the first thing I do with every sentence, if I can, usually I can without figuring other things out first, but what is the subject? Okay. Well, the way to know the subject of a given sentence, because remember there's a subject and a predicate, subject and a verb and everything surrounding the verb comprising the predicate. Sometimes the subject is there to be underlined and sometimes it's not. And when it's not, quite often it's because it's elliptical, leaving something out. It's leaving out the subject. How? Because in Latin you can have the verb, the main verb, as often, if not usually, happens. You can have the verb without the, the pronoun. Okay, so so here you have the verb abutere, which in the commentary, as you see, is an alternate form of abuteris, which is second person singular of the verb meaning abuse. And that implies that tu, tu, is the missing subject. So we're not going to be able to underline the subject as I like to do, but I also underline the main verb of a given sentence. So that's what I'll do here. So with abutere, I just like to underline it. And if two were mentioned there, as is often the case for emphatic reasons, then I would have that underlined as well. So I single underline subjects and verbs, so you, main verbs. So you'll get used to that in these analyses. Okay. So next thing to figure out is, is this verb transitive or intransitive? If it's intransitive, then you don't need to look for an object. If it's um, transitive, you do. In this case, we are lucky enough to begin with an anomaly, and that is that utor, the verb meaning use, in any other compound form of it with uh, a prefix such as this one, um, takes not the direct object accusative, but rather the ablative. And that's just something to learn in your first year of Latin. You need to look for that ablative. So where would that be? Looks like it would be patientia nostra, doesn't it? Now, how do we know that patientia nostra is not in the nominative? Because it's an ambiguous form. You don't have the macrons here to help you out, which is cheating in my book, so that's good. When you look at real Latin in real text, you're not going to have the, the marks that tell you what long and short, which, which words have long vowels and which have short. So here, patientia nostra, although it's ambiguous, you could have something like patientia nostra est bona. Our patience is good. But you don't have that. Why? process of elimination. You know that abutare is abutaris and that it has to implied, which is the subject of the verb, and therefore you already have your subject taken care of, and unless patientia nostra is in apposition with, um, with the missing to, which it isn't, um, then you um, are going to have um, patientia nostra be the um, ablative. So normally direct objects I like to double underline to get a sense of the relationship between the main verb and, and the double underlined um, uh, direct object. In this case, patientia nostra, if you really think about it, it's adverbial in the sense that um, to abuse with respect to 
our patience, you see. That's the way, that's what's going on here when it comes to um, the relationship between patientia and abutare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark up patientia nostra not as a double underlined direct object since it's not an accusative, which I like to um, keep, uh, that's what I like to reserve double underlines for as accusatives, but rather put into parentheses as I do, as you'll see, all of the adverbial elements of a given sentence. Why? You'll see. Okay, so now, uh, except for vocatives, which I like to put in the um, triangular bracket. And that's what this is, Catalina. Okay. Now, quo usque tandem. Let's start with tandem. Tandem at length. Okay. It's adverbial. And quo usque. Pretty much up until how far? Up until up until what? Something like that, which is also adverbial. So, why do I put adverbial elements in parentheses? Because it's kind of like psychologically satisfying to eliminate aspects of a sentence that don't necessarily have to exist in order for the rest of the sentence to be complete. Okay, now in the case of um, abuse, taking the ablative rather than an accusative as its sort of object, um, that is a little different since um, utor you expect um, this ablative um, object, if you will. But otherwise, with quo usque and tandem, for example, you can get rid of those words and you would still have a complete sentence. Let's do, let's do that for fun. So you get rid of that, and what do you have? Abutere Catalina Patientia Nostra? Will you abuse our patients, Catalina? Well, if you want to put what I just took out back, you see that the adverbial elements are syntactically superfluous. And I said syntactically. I didn't say in sense, but I said syntactically, syntactically per superfluous. That is a valuable thing to understand from the get-go here in trying to come to terms with an author who, let's just say, is not considered to be one of the easiest. Um, what I plan on doing in these videos is showing you that, in fact, he's not s so difficult. Um, Cicero's pretty, pretty easy once you get used to him. Now, why is that? Very simply, because he's unambiguous in what he says. Yeah, look, Latin's not that hard, you guys. The only the, the first year is the year you need to really kick butt in learning the morphology. But then, syntactically, it's just so fun to, to see how these puzzles uh, fit together. Let's jump on to the next uh, sentence. Quam duetiam furor iste tuus nos eludet? All right. Number one, is there an unambiguous nominative that we can underline? In other words, the, um, ob the, the subject of the sentence. Quam duetiam furor iste tuus nos eludet? Well, if you ask me, iste and tuus and furor, iste tuus, furor, are all in what case? Unambiguously, they are in the nominative, and therefore I'm going to underline them as what? Oops, that was a double underline. Underline them as the subject. Then I like to go on to find the verb, the main verb. Eludet. Will what? Elude for want of a better, you know, there are a bunch of possibilities for translating. I'm not going to get too bogged down in translation per se um, here because we're more concerned about understanding how things fit together than we are in what exact um, permutation of meaning each of these words has. That's another that's kind of the next level of, of translating professionally, where, where that, that concerns us more than um, simply trying to come to terms with what's going on. Okay, so that'll be our priority here. That fury of yours, we would say in English, or, or that your fury, okay, will elude is a transitive verb. Therefore, you are going to next want to look for a direct object. And we have one, don't we? 
Although the form is ambiguous, nos could be the nominative. In this case, it's most likely the accusative because we're looking for a direct object. And what I do with accusative direct objects, as I've said, is I double underline them. I just, I just love that. I don't know. And I'm kind of nerdy with language, so, so bear with me. Quam duetium. Oh, there we go again. Just like quo usque tandem, here we have quam duetium. Three words that are adverbial. Coincidence. Let me break the news to you. Barely, if anything, in Cicero is coincidental when it comes to his style, his prose style. Quam duetium. All adverbial. How long even? or how long indeed, or how long um, also, something like that. Fura isti tu is no se ludet. Okay, now, just as I got rid of quo usque tandem, and we had a complete sentence with abutere Catalina patiatia nostra, so with quam duetiam, if I get rid of that, we have a complete sentence with furor uh, iste tu us no se ludet. Interesting, right? So let's just, for the fun of it, get rid of this again, too. And look at that. We have Abutere Catalina Patiatio Nostra, Furor Institutus Nostra Ludet. Ew! Okay, now why do we need to have that adverbial stuff? Well, it just gives you more information about how it is that Cicero means Abutere and how he means a Ludet, you see. They're called adverbial for good reason. That is, they qualify the verb. Not always. Sometimes they qualify uh, adjectives, um, but usually um, adverbs, as the name would imply, um, qualify verbs. Quim ad finem se se frenata yactabit audacia? Quim ad finem. So now, eh, I guess that looks a little scary, but let's demystify it. That's what I like, how I like to put it. Let's demystify the sentence. What is the subject? Okay. If you don't, if, if there's ambiguity in how things look, um, you might want to start by looking at the verb and saying, okay, well, what does the person and number tell me about what the subject looks like? If the number is plural, you're going to look for a plural subject. If the number is singular, you're going to look for a singular subject. In this case, what do you have? Is Ephranata or Audacia, both of which look the same, uh, syntactically, so um, as possible nominatives, which one of them would be the subject? Well, it's very easy. Audacia is a noun, and Ephranata is not. Ephranata is a, is a um, ad adjective, and so the adjective is going to qualify the noun. So Audacia is going to be our subject, right? And so we're going to single underline the subject. Um, now, Ephranata will hold off on because there are two kinds of adjectives. There's a predicative adjective and a um, attributive adjective. Attributive is nothing but the good dog, good, simply taking for granted the dog is good, as opposed to the dog is good, in which case the dog um, is, the, is the subject, um, is is the verb, and good is the predicative or predicate adjective on the other side of the copula verb is. Um, in this case, um, we don't know yet. Okay, so audacia, now that's the nominative. What is the verb? Well, the main verb unambiguously is yaktabit. Okay, being the future of the, mer of the frequentative verb uh, meaning to keep on th keep on throwing, okay. Um, frequentative is a fancy grammatical term having to do with um, verbs that are built um, from the fourth principal part of a given Latin verb um, turned into a first conjugation verb. Happens f every once in a while for emphasis, okay. But what we need to know for now is just we have yacto, yacto, um, yactare. So. We know that Ephrenata is going to be qualifying Audacia as a attribute as an attributive adjective, since you don't have a form of to be um, following Audacia. If it, if it were something like Audacia est Ephrenata, unbridled, 
Okay, frenum in Latin meaning a bridle. So this is a neat little um, adjective meaning um, ephrenata, un, unrestrained, unbridled. Okay, um, it's an attributive adjective, so we're going to underline it in the single. So what you have here is ephrenata audacia yactabit, unbridled, the unbridled um, audacity will throw, and then throw what? Say say. Okay, which is really say, just em emphatic. And so what case is say say in? The um, reflexive pronoun itself in the, you guessed it, accusative, direct object of yaktabit. Okay. And then quem ad finem is what? It's the same as ad quem finem. Ad being the preposition taking the accusative, and that's something you have to learn in the first year of Latin. It's just uh, memorizing it as a vocabulary item. Ad plus the accusative. Ad and then quem, right? Um, the, the interrogative pronoun. Finem, from finis, meaning end. So toward what end? Toward what end? Ad etc. So when you have a preposition followed by its object, you have what's called a prepositional phrase. And I'm going to say something right now that a student um, was flabbergasted by decades ago when I delivered this bulletin to him. And he took about a week to do research and look into it and finally admitted that I was right about it. It sounds a little bit radical, but here it goes. You ready? Every single prepositional phrase in the history of humankind is adverbial. You're welcome. Okay? Let's test it out. And therefore, I put it in parentheses, because I put everything adverbial in parentheses. Quim ad finem. Quem ad finem se se fernati octabit audacia. What does quem ad finem qualify? You guessed it. Octabit. It qualifies octabit because it says toward what end Catalan's audacity will throw itself. Will throw itself toward what end? It's not qualifying audacia. Okay? but rather the throwing. Toward what end will the audacity throw itself? Right? The unbridled audacity throw itself. All right? So, again, let's test out this whole idea about taking out adverbial elements. Get rid of this for a second and see if it still is a complete sentence. Will implied your unbridled audacity throw itself. It's the quim ad fidem that kind of gets across the temporal idea of how long um, it will do so. All right, let's move on to the next sentence, which is a doozy and quite fun as long as we break it down. Take a look at it and allow yourself to be scared by it. As crazy as that sounds. Allow yourself to be mystified by it, and then let's demystify it. Because it really isn't nearly as difficult as it seems. There are various clauses, it's true, but what's really going on here is no more or less than a process of addition. We have a compound subject, a subject comprised of various elements that make up the plural subject for the main verb. So let's begin our demystifying process by finding that main verb. And then it's simple as picking up the pieces and finding the various subjects and the satellitic material, that is, the material surrounding it, the atmospheric okay. material. So let's start with finding the verb. 
Where is the unambiguous mean verb of this sentence? Well, that shouldn't be too hard to find. But you're going to have to move up to the very end of it, aren't you? And that does happen a lot in Latin, by the way. So there's our verb. And moverunt from the verb moveo, meaning to move. And in this case, it's in the perfect tense. So have not a, b, c, d, e, f moved you? Have not all of these things moved you? You idiot, Catiline, is the idea. And then we have adverbial material on the side. So, nihil ne te nocturnum presidium palati. So that's going to be the first A, B, C, D, E, F of six sub-subjects, if you will, parts of the subject. Okay, so let's figure out what, what's going on here. But before even getting to that, this, this, this one, then this one, then this one, etc., what I like to do is look for patterns. And the first pattern that we can detect is the adverbialness of nihil. Nihil. Nihil, which, as you know, is a noun, but here it's being used in the accusative case, which is an ambiguous form when it's in the neuter gender, and thereby doubling as an adverb through what is sometimes referred to as the cognate accusative. This is kind of a cognate accusative. So it really means not at all, or with respect to nothing, you see? So so if you're using it in, in adverbially as a neuter accusative, it means with respect to nothing? With respect, and then the ne here is just a particle that you add uh, interrogatively um, at all. It's enclitic too. Look into that. Maybe I'll do a separate. Um, I'll talk about enclitic sometime uh, in the future. But um, for now, just realize it's a little particle. It doesn't have to be there. It's emphatic. Okay. So what you really have is nihil, 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 etc. And um, f for that matter, there could be nihil, ne, nihil, ne, nihil, ne, nihil, ne, all the way through as well. So this is another example of many, <clears throat> I was going to say on every page, but pretty much in every sentence of Cicero, of stylistic choices, or of a stylistic choice. This is a stylistic choice to use the nay here, but not to use it there. Why? Well, redundancy. But wait a minute, why even have it in the first place? For emphasis. It's choices. It's stylistic choices. Now, by the way, these are the kinds of choices that don't necessarily come through in translations. And that's why it's so important, among other reasons, many, many reasons, to learn the original language. Right? Okay. So, not at all, let's translate nihil as. Not at all. Not at all. A... Not at all B, not at all C, not at all D, not at all E, not at all F, have moved you? How did that happen? All of a sudden it's an easy sentence, huh? Yeah, now it's just a matter of finding how the pieces work. Here, there, there are um, six pieces that make up the subject. Nocturnum presidium palati. All right. The nocturnal, the, the nighttime, if you will, presidium, okay, um, the, the, the nighttime guard, or literally sitting before, sitting in front of and protecting something that protects, 
right? So the nighttime or, or nightly guard of the Palantir of Rome, one of the seven hills, all of those are in the nominative, right? And then what is the te doing there? You'll see. Let's hold off on the te. Not at all. Wigilii urbis, the vigils, the watches of the city, another nominative. Not at all the fear, the timor of the people. It's a nice example of how learning Latin helps you so much with English. My goodness. Because you, you see the word timorous and you'll never not know what it means if you know that timor means fear, right? So let alone timeo, the, the verb, so you associate it with that. So there's just, hmm. sorry, I, I'm geeking out. I, I just love Latin. Um, concursus bonorum omnium. The concourse, the running together of all of the bony, not of all the good men in the way it would mean in English, because it's not a generic goodness we're talking about, but what? Well, you need to know some history in order to know what bony means here. It means the good people, yes, but it really means the one, the in crowd, okay, the aristocrats, the ones with power, the one, the 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 the, the players, the game changers of Roman society, of whom Cicero eventually became a member, but after a notoriously difficult climb from his relatively modest background outside of the nobility into none other than the Senate to become by far the greatest of the orators slash lawyers of the Senate. So there's an important background to this very idea of the bony referred to here in the genitive that Cicero refers to. Nihil hic muditissimus sabendi senatus locus, this um, most fortified, and there's a superlative, the superlative degree of the adjective, quite often not meaning the most, but rather quite, very much. All right, so that's what it means here because you're not comparing it to anything. So, so most fortified, or as it says in our book, excellently fortified, which is kind of weird, but that's okay. This most fortified, uh, munai, um, don't get me started on, on the etymology of, 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 of munai, it, it, walls. So a community is when you share walls with people. Isn't that cool? So the online community um, or, or online communities um, are what they are because they sh uh, the peop the, their members share walls with each other, whether it be literally or figuratively, physical or virtual. What is the noun that munitissimus, the adjective, qualifies? Not habendi. Is it senatus? Hmm. This quite fortified... Senate? Hmm. No, because Loki would be the genitive in it to go with habendi, of having a place, which is kind of weird. No. So through process of elimination, you know that locus is going to be the noun qualified by munitissimus. And hic is this most, um, most fortified or, or quite fortified place of holding the Senate. Now, as you see in our um, quite <laughs> comprehensive text by Archibald A. McClarty, that we're dealing with a gerundival construction that really means habendi senatum, but the case of senatum is attracted to the case 
of what begins as a gerund, and it becomes a gerundive through the transformation it undergoes by linking up with the accusative direct object that in turn becomes a genitive object of what now is a gerundive. Now, I have problems with this concept that all of the first-year Latin books describe this as, because what's really happening here is just because synoptum turns into the same case as the gerund doesn't mean that the gerund really essentially becomes a gerundive any more than a noun can become an adjective just because of the way it looks or works syntactically. It, it doesn't lose its gerundness, if you will. Habendi doesn't. It really doesn't stop being a gerund just because <laughs> senatum is attracted to its case and it becomes this construction that the grammarians like to call a gerundive construction. But, but um, it's a little tricky. I and then um, horum ora vultus quae. Um, ora vultus quae. So what do we have here? The quae obviously is added to the end of a word instead of preceding it as a separate word et. That's all the quay means is ora et voltus. It just trips off the tongue more conveniently to do it this way. The 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 facial expressions, the voltus, the faces, the, the expressions on the faces. Um, and then the faces. So, so we have what seems to be tautological here, the, the faces and the faces, right? But this is a good example of how there is a distinction bef between aura and the, the, the faces and what is on the faces of these people, of these what? Of these senators that are overhearing us or overhearing that are, that are eavesdropping on me speaking to you, so on our conversation, even though you're silent, and will eventually run away out of the city in fear of the repercussions of this very speech, or really series of four speeches. Good enough? Okay. So, nihil ne te nocturum. So now try to follow along with this, and I think you'll find it, well, demystified. Nihil ne te nocturnum presidium palati, that's A, nihil urbis vigiliae, B, nihil timor populi, C, nihil concursus bonorum omnium, D, nihil hic munitissimus habendi senatus locus, E, and nihil horum ora voltus quae, F, moverunt, have they not moved you? Easy, right? Well, that's what we're going to do the rest of the time uh, to all these sentences. We're going to do our best to understand them, uh, demystify them, and um, you'll find that because Cicero is such a consummate stylist, um, user of Latin, that by mastering Cicero, you've pretty much mastered Latin. Okay? Or Livy, I would say. Okay? Then you're ready to read Tacitus. Okay? In the same way that if you master Plato, you're ready to read Thucydides, say. Okay, anyway. Okay, now we get on to a really fun sentence. I love this. I love this one. Um, grammatically speaking, it'll be really fun to talk about. Okay. Patere tua concilia non sentis, constrictam iam horum omnium scientia teneri, conjurationem tuam non vides. All right. What are we going to do? First, find that main verb. And that would be, do you not see? All right. So once we have do you not see, the question is what? Do you not see canem? Do you not see the dog? That's what you expect, right? Because unless you're talking about seeing in general, you need a direct object because it's a transitive verb. Okay. So do you not see the dog? Well, I don't see Kanem anywhere, right? So what do I see? So what's the next thing to look for? 
the next thing to look for is a direct object. Do you see how each Latin sentence is an expedition? That's what we're doing here. We're going on an expedition to find the puzzle pieces that fit together in a way that makes the sentence make sense and you feel like you know Latin. And you do that with each sentence and before you know it, the sentences start sounding like music, like poetry, like literature, rather than things you've memorized over the course of the first year of Latin. So let's do this. What do you see? Well, do you not see? The not, obviously, is adverbial. Not. I do see. I do not see. The not is simply qualifying the seeing. Do you not see what? Tua concilia non se... Uh-oh. Okay, sorry. We also have another... Okay, we have another main verb. Sorry, I skipped. Okay, so we have sentence as well. Do you not sense? Do you not sense in the same way as we days expects a direct object, so does sentence, okay? Do you not sense in the same as, just as with we days you expect a direct object, so with sentence you do, don't you? So do you not sense what? Do you not sense? Do you not sense that something is the case is usually what the direct object of sentence would be. Now, wait a minute. That sounds weird. The direct object of sentence? Now, we days taking a direct object is easy to understand. Conem, do you not see the dog? Because you're dealing with perception. And the direct object of a perceptive verb is obviously the thing you see. But wait a minute. Sense is an idea. So I don't sense the dog. And I guess I could. I sense the existence of the dog, and if you want to shorten that, I guess, sent it, do, do you not sense the dog being here? You know, um, something like that it would be. But here, do you not sense that something is the case? And how do we express that? Well, here's your answer. Patere to a concilia. Your counsels to be lying open. All right? Now, your counsels to be like a pate, pateo, meaning to lie open. Um, a patio is the part of the house outside that lies open to company, to have a party in. Isn't that interesting? Stuff like that. Okay. So, so to a concilia is ambiguous in its form. It is either the nominative or the accusative. How do you know it's not the nominative? Oh, because the implied subject of sentence is, in this, is, is the nominative, isn't it? To. Known to sentence. That's really what this means, doesn't it? Known to sentence. Patera to. If that were there, it would be easier to know that to a concilia is not nominative, wouldn't it? Because that would, unless it were in apposition, be contradictory. So, we know that to a concilia has to be in the accusative to begin with. And that makes sense because we have what is called an accusative subject of the infinitive, don't we? All right. To a concilia patere. Now here's the beauty. Here's why I love the sentence so much. Patere is an infinitive. It's not a complementary infinitive, however, such as the house likes to lie open. As absurd as that is, you get my point. Likes um, to lie open. In that case, patere would be a complementary infinitive, correct? But in this case, we have a different kind of infinitive, and it's my favorite kind. It's a substantive infinitive. It is an infinitive that does justice to the fact, get ready, get ready, that an infinitive is a noun. And yet it can have an accusative subject because why? Oh, because it's a verbal noun. All right. When we get into participles, we'll see why they are called what they are called. They take part in two different things, verbs and, ad and adjectives, don't they? Well, there you go. Spoiler. So your counsels, your literally, I love this, leaping together, right? That's what concilia are. Your leapings together, but just, you know, counsels, lie open. Your counsels to lie open or lying open 
est bonum. Est bonum. That's possible, okay? It's possible to have a sentence, patere tua concilia est bonum. Isn't that weird? But it's true. Because patere tua concilia, your counsels to I open, is a noun. Patere is a noun. And because it can take an accusative subject that lets you know what or who is lying open, that is one unit. That's a, that's a substantive unit. And therefore, it can be qualified by an adjective in the neuter. Okay? Because an infinitive is a neuter noun. But that's not what we have, is it? Right? We have... This. Patere tua concilia non sentis. Do you not sense your counsel? Okay, so I single underline patere tua concilia, but because it isn't the subject, like the missing two would be, I'm going to double underline it because it's the direct object. Isn't that nice? Constrictam yam horum omnium scientia teneri conjurationem tuam non vides. This is even a little more complex and therefore mysterious, but let's demystify it. Do you not see what? Do you not see conem? No, it doesn't say, do you not see the dog? It says, do you not see blank? What is the blank? Do you not see? Let's look for a, an accusative. Let's start with that. Constrictam conurationem, right? Do you not see the constrained or constricted, held firm conspiracy? Swearing together. Swearing together is what it literally means. Okay, do you not see the constricted conspiracy? Your constricted conspiracy. Is that all there is to this? No. If that's all there were to it, then there wouldn't be these other words. <laughs> What's going on with them? Let's start with the easy stuff. Yam just means now, so that's adverbial. Now. Do you not see... There are two choices here. This accusative, constrictam conurationem tuam, could either be a direct object... Or, you guessed it, the accusative subject of an infinitive. And in this case, the infinitive is passive rather than active. To be held, from tenere, meaning hold. Okay? And again, I'm sure there's a better definition for tenere here, um, but we'll say just to be held. Now, what do we have? Do you not see... Your conspiracy to be held now constrictam constrictam constricted or held firm and now what? Scientia horum omnium. Now scientia is ambiguous in form. It could be nominative, or it could be what? Ablative, right? Is it nominative? No. How do you know? Because of the implied to here, right? So it has to be ablative. So what's going on? Well, we have an ablative of means. The means by which the accusative subject of the infinitive plus the infinitive have come about, that your conspiracy is held, constrictam, constrained, by means of the knowledge of all of these men. Adverbial. Now, like I've said, adverbial material can be left out of a sentence and it would still be a complete sentence. Let's test that theory. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. And even this for the fun of it. 
understand this. Do you sense your counsels to lie open? Do you see your conspiracy to be held constrained by the knowledge of whatever? But we don't need by the knowledge of whatever. We don't need the knowns. We don't need any of the adverbial stuff. The adverbial stuff adds meaning to the sentence that wouldn't otherwise be there. You see that? Now, I'm sorry about the... I Normally, I would probably edit out my fumbling around to try to translate tenere and constrictam, but I just wanted you to get a sense that the reason we learn ancient Greek and Latin is not to have to fumble around with another language to approximate what it says. And here in English, it just so happens that constrictum, we want to translate as something like to be held firm or held firm. And then tenere means to hold and tenere means to be held. And so you're using the word hold in English for both of those words, but differently, aren't you? And so that's what makes the translation difficult. So if we took more time, we could come up with a better translation. But even listen to McClarity's uh, translation. He had a lot of time to come up with it. And it still sounds a little weird, doesn't it? Do you not see that your conspiracy is already fast held and bound in the knowledge of all who are, etc.? Kind of weird, right? Kind of weird English. So get used to that. But look at how elegant the Latin is. And that's the key, to internalize the meanings of these things and not need to translate into English as an intermediary between you and the meaning of the words. Okay? All right, next sentence. Quid proxima, quid superiore nocte egeris, ubi fueris, quos convocaveris, quid concilii keperis, quem nostrum ignorare arbitraris? Another demystification expedition coming up. All right, this next sentence is the most difficult so far, I would say. Need, it requires a bit of maneuvering to understand. Quid proxima, quid superiore nocte egeris, ubi fueris, quos convocaveris, quid concilii keperis, quem nostrum ignorari arbitraris? Now, this is a little difficult, but... Let's demystify it, and it will be easy. Let's find the main verb. Where is the main verb? Obviously, it is arbitraris. From the deponent verb, arbitror, and do you judge? Arbitrate is the English word we get from it. Do you think? Which is weaker but more appropriate to this context, I suppose, but maybe not because we need to understand that um, there's a lot of legal energy in this speech, and he is a lawyer after all. So, you know, do you judge that this or that is the case? Okay, Do you judge what? Either that something is the case, or that someone does something, and that's what we have here, quem which is really aliquem. Si, nisi, ut, and ne, all the alis drop away. You judge someone of us to be ignorant of the fact that... Boy, takes a lot of English words to get that point across, huh? Ignorant of quid, quid, ubi, Quos and quid. Do you see? That's the structure of this sentence. And I'll end with this one. There's a lot to take in. Whom of us do you think is ignorant of A, B, C, D, and E? Suddenly it's easy, right? It's only a matter of finding what these things are. So quid will be 
the direct object of ignorare. So I'll use a different sort of double underline to get across that it is the direct object of, in effect, part of the direct object of the main verb. You see that? Which of us do you think is ignorant of all of these things? Okay. And all of these things are going to be, in effect, direct objects of ignorare. Ignorant of what? Quid proxima quid superiore nocte agoris. What last night, the night closest to the one today, the proximate night, what on the superior night, the, the one beyond that, so the, the one on the night before last, and then nocte is qualified both by superiore and proxima. So you could theoretically have uh, proxima nocte and superiore nocte. You could have it mentioned, but um, Cicero avoids redundancy every once in a while. Sometimes he doesn't, but quite often. What last night, what on the night before you did? You agoed. Okay, ago, egi, right? And agaris is going to be the perfect subjunctive. Yes, we use perfect subjunctives, and here's proof of it. Why are we using a perfect subjunctive here? Quite simply because it's indirect, right? So instead of asking, what did you do last night and the night before last? That would be direct. And that would be perfect. What did you do? But if you say something like, and now I'm changing it a little, I'm going to ask you what you did the night before last. Then it would be in the subjunctive to get across that you're in a secondary construction. All right? So we are going to turn all of these words into this strange looking underline to get across the point that it's in effect the direct object of this element of the direct object of arbitraris. Okay, and the same thing with these other ones. Where you were, another perfect subjunctive in this case of sum, fui, not really built from sum, but um, it's used as the perfect of, of sum, fui. Quos convocavaris, another perfect subjunctive, whom you convoked, whom you called together. All right. So here um, you have, just as you have a kind of direct object of this direct object clause here, you have a kind of direct object of the verb, which together comprise a kind of direct object for this element of the direct object of the main verb. And the same thing here. Quid consili keperis. What of counsel you took. What counsel you took. What of counsel you took. Okay, now what kind of genitive is this? It's a part of genitive. Of all the counsel in the world, this is the counsel you took. What of counsel? And again, all of this together should be considered to function as a kind of direct object of this part of the direct object of the main verb. That's why this is a relatively complex sentence. Okay? You have direct objects of direct objects of direct objects. And if I had a triple underline, I would, un I would triple underline quid, quid, quos. But what about ubi? Well, that's adverbial. Where you were. Direct objects, as I said in a video I made recently, which I'll put up on the top right of the screen for you to look, really do function as adverbs in the sense that they 
qualify the verb. They say something about the verb. They, they give you a better idea of uh, what the relationship between the verb and the object is. And the thing or person or whatever is. Quid proxima, quid superior note agris. What last night, what on the night before last you did, where you were, whom you convoked, who, whom you called together, what counsel, what of counsel you took? Do you think any of us are ignorant of what you did last night, the night before, where you were, whom you convoked, and what counsel you took? You see, suddenly it's easy, isn't it? We're going to start next week with the most famous sentence, not only in this oration, but I dare say one of the top, I don't know, five or ten in all of ancient Greco-Roman civilization.